I have a couple of um, things to start out with that I want to uh, talk to you about. They'll be very brief before I go into the lecture itself. A number of people have asked me about uh, writings, um, my writings, and maybe one or two other uh, writings that might be useful that would reflect this kind of approach to mysticism. Uh, some of the books were there. I see, I'm glad to see that some of them sold out. That's always good for, for authors. But um, let me mention two of my own books and maybe one other so I don't overload you. Um, I'm writing this long history of Christian mysticism, as you know, and I'm now on volume six, part two, which is about to be published. And I'm working on volume six, part three. It'll never end, but I keep moving ahead uh, with it. But these are long, very long, and, and serious academic books. I, I'm pleased that a number of people read them. But my publisher, right from the time I began that series, was after me to say, well, you know, can you give us a, a more user-friendly, reader-friendly <laughs> version of some of this? And I, I kept putting it off and saying, oh, you know, I, I, I'm hard at work on this volume or that volume, et cetera. And finally, I had one of those moments of enlightenment where I said to myself, but Pat and I could do it together. We could work on the book together because she reads and edits and recommends many changes in all the things that I write. So we took on that, uh, that project and uh, we produced a little book called Early Christian Mystics, The Divine Vision of the Spiritual Masters, Early Christian Mystics. It's a short book. It's meant to be an introductory book and it takes a dozen mystics of the first 12 centuries using mostly material from what I had already written, gives you a brief introduction of 15 or 20 pages, and it also gives recommendations for reading, text to read uh, at the end of that. And it's, it's been a book that's had, had some success. So I, I would recommend that. It's, it's a lot more friendly to the average reader. When we tell people, uh, Pat and I, that we wrote a book together, the question we usually get is, did you fight a lot? <laughs> <laughs> and we had a few disagreements. I don't want to say this was a, but uh, we enjoyed the experience of working on, on a book together rather than having to continue to be at, at loggerheads with each other. Oh, you should do it this way, you should do it that way, etc. Uh, the other book uh, is a book called Essential Writings of Christian Mysticism. The Essential Writings of Christian Mysticism. And that's a fairly large anthology. Oh, it's close to 600 pages of mystical texts with my introduction, but structured according to the basic themes of Christian mysticism. And Random House actually came to me back about 2004 or five and asked me, said, well, we need a good anthology of Christian mysticism. There were many anthologies, and some of them I think are, are good anthologies. They're usually a chronological. The Essential Writings book tries to be thematic, it takes what I think of as the major themes of preparation for the consciousness of and the effect of Christian mysticism, and gives selections. Uh, usually, there it is, you want to wave that around? <laughs> Thank you, yeah, I don't have a copy with me. So, uh, and and it's, a, it's an affordable book, and it's not a book you want to read all the way through, it's long, but you can read sections of it under headings like mystical union, under headings like asceticism, under headings like action and contemplation, under headings uh, you know, like uh, mysticism and heresy, etc. Uh, so, and it's used as a textbook in, in many, many courses on, uh, on mysticism. A third book, I'll just mention this, uh, a student of mine and uh, a, a very good friend, uh, Friar Dennis Tamburillo, T-A-M-B-U-R, L-L-O, Dennis Tamborello. He teaches at Siena College in, uh, in New York. And uh, he's written a lot on mysticism. And he did a little book called Ordinary Mysticism. Ordinary Mysticism. I use that phrase, everyday mysticism. Uh, well, that's what Dennis is talking about. It's a small book. It's published by Paulus Press. Oh, it's less than 200 pages. Uh, I wrote the preface for it uh, as well, but I think it's a very good short introduction to much of what I've been trying to argue and, and suggest here, that mysticism is not just for the elite. <laughs> mysticism is everybody, uh, everybody's task. It's ordinary. It should come into our lives. And I was reflecting uh, you know, on that, because a number of people have come up to me and said, oh, this idea of, you know, everyday mysticism or ordinary mysticism, 
that's wonderful. It's new. I've never heard of that before. Well, it's actually very old. And um, you know, I, I have a couple of quotations here. I just drew these up the day before I, I, I came down from great teachers in the tradition who make it quite clear that mysticism is universal. The first one is from Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas. Thomas's first great work was his commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard. It's a great big long work, too long to have ever been translated. But in, in book three, in one place, in his commentary on the sentences, he's answering objections. And he's answering the fifth objection. And it's a very brief quotation, but listen carefully. To the fifth point, we say that not everyone in the active life will come to the perfect state of contemplation. Nonetheless, every Christian who is in the state of salvation must participate in some way in contemplation. Since the precept is directed to all, it says, be still and see that I am the Lord. That's Psalm 14.2. So every Christian who is in the state of salvation Thomas says, must participate in some way in contemplation. That's everyday mysticism. We all won't be on the same level. There's that continuum. But it is a continuum in which all the baptized are supposed to share. And I think I mentioned uh, <clears throat> this morning that a text from uh, Gregory the Great, from his homilies in Ezekiel, says pretty much the same thing. Here I'll give you the full uh, quotation. Gregory says, the gift of contemplation is not given just to the highest, he means the clergy, and not just to the least, but frequently to the highest, frequently to the least, and more frequently it is given to those who are set apart. The Latin word there is remoti, set apart. That means the monks. They're set apart from the community. And sometimes even the married receive it. <laughs> You'll be glad to know. <laughs> <laughs> and he concludes from this, therefore there is no Christian state from which the grace of contemplation can be excluded. So it's open to everyone. Uh, whoever has an interior heart, he goes on to say, can be illuminated by the light of contemplation. Whoever has an interior heart can be illuminated by the light of contemplation. So, you know, this is a very general, and th this teaching about everyday mysticism is not new. I have a raft of other quotations. I have a long quotation here from Bernard Clairvaux that says the same thing. And if I started to hunt, I could give you scores and scores of quotations from all the great mystical masters who make exactly the same point. And it's the point that now we're putting under this category of everyday mysticism or ordinary mysticism. Uh, one, one last point. Uh, I really much very much enjoyed the question and answer periods here, and the questions have been very interesting and often very, make me think about uh, different kinds of issues. But it, I've also reflected there may be some people who want to ask questions who haven't had the chance or have some particular issue that they'd like to have addressed. And what we might think of doing, I mean, if you want to do this, uh, if, if you want to write out a question, no, not at great length, but if you wanted to write out a specific kinds of question, the organizers are going to put a little basket <laughs> in the front uh, here. And if you want to write something out that you really want to have answered, but you haven't had, had the chance to address because there's so many hands going up all over the place, if you would write that out tomorrow, I think we can find some time somewhere. Um, these talks can be lengthened or shortened, depending, but find some 10 or 15 minutes or so where I could address those questions specifically. So feel welcome to do that if you want to. If, if you don't, that's perfectly fine as well. But I thought it was an idea that might, uh, might try, okay? All right. Well, the, the title of this talk is Lexio Divina, Sacred Reading, Divine Reading, and Contemplatio. And I'm going to talk about the contribution of the Cistercians and the Carthusians, two of the great monastic orders, monastic reform orders of the 12th century, uh, who tried to create a system, if you will, of, uh, of 
Christian prayer, the kind of path to prayer, contemplation, and union that begins with sacra, uh, Lectio Divina and moves on through meditation, prayer, etc., etc. But these are roadmaps. And I'm going to start with one of the most famous of these. Many of you will be familiar with it, but I'm reading a quotation from a Carthusian prior, a man called Guigo, Guigo the uh, Second in a book he called The Ladder of Monks, The Scala Claustralium. It's a very short book. I, I didn't bring a copy here, but in translation, and there are several English translations, it's only 50 or 60 pages. But here's the quotation. Reading, Lexio, is the careful study of the scriptures, concentrating all one's powers on it. Meditation, meditatio, is the busy application of the mind to seek help with one's own reason for knowing hidden truths. Prayer, oratio, petitionary prayer, is the heart's devoted turning to God to drive away all evil and to obtain what is good. Contemplation, contemplatio, is when the mind is in some sort of way lifted up to God and held above itself so that it tastes the joys of everlasting sweetness. So you've got four uh, rungs on the ladder. Lexio, meditatio, oratio, and contemplatio. And we go on to describe those in, in, in some detail. That, that's one of the most uh, popular roadmaps in the history of Christian mysticism. Uh, it obviously reflects the life of monastics, but it's used in many other contexts throughout the whole of the tradition, often quoted and, uh, and cited. So I want to talk about each of the rungs in the ladder that begin from Lectio Divina and that move on to Contemplatio, but that it also include, in a necessary way, Meditatio and, and Oratio. Now, the importance of Lexio Divina, which of course has been powerfully revived in our own uh, days, and its relationship to contemplatio is actually rooted in the monastic tradition, especially in the Rule of Benedict. In chapter 48 of the Rule of Benedict, which is a chapter on daily manual labor, Benedict says, the brothers ought to have specified times for manual labor and also set hours aside for sacred reading. Set hours, particular hours. In Latin is certis horis, definite hours. You've got to make a space for it. And this setting aside of time for sacred reading is especially true, Benedict says, in the time of Lent, when he says that in Lent, at least, each one, each one of the brothers is to receive a book from the library and to read the whole of it straight through. Finish the whole book during the course of Lent, per ordinum ex integro. So Benedict made Lectio Divina central to the Benedictine uh, tradition. And what we'll find with these later monks following Benedict will be to incorporate it into this whole schema that's so nicely laid out in, uh, in Guigo. And this uh, is uh, uh, particularly the case with regard to the 12th century and the 12th century monastic reforms of the Carthusians and, and the Cistercians. Um, the late 11th century and the 12th century in Western Europe was a time of the reform of monasticism. Over the course of centuries since the time of Benedict, you know, who lived in the 6th century, Monasticism had flourished in Western Europe. Benedictine monasticism gradually pushed out other forms like the Celtic monasticism and the like, uh, and had been very important to the maintenance of civilization uh, in the, the early medieval period when things had kind of collapsed after the downfall of the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire. Um, the monks and the great monasteries were central to even political power in those days. Great rulers like Charlemagne tried to reform monasticism and uh, saw monasticism as kind of essential to their own uh, notion of Christendom, a Christian society. But monasticism itself had suffered under barbarian invasions and from internal kind of strife, etc. 
So most of Western monasticism by, let's say, the 9th century and the early 10th century was kind of a mess. The rule of Benedict was not well observed. Monasteries were often taken over by lay lords. Why? Because monasteries were very wealthy, and the lay lords wanted the money. And of course, the lay lords weren't very interested in a good observance of the rule of Benedict, etc. So this was an era, 100 years, 150 years of kind of the nadir of monasticism. But starting the end of the 10th century, throughout the course of the 11th and into the 12th century, monastic leaders arose who said, look, we have to clean up, we have to reform monasticism, we have to get back to the original vision that Benedict and, and others had. And uh, so you have monastic reforms beginning all over Europe, Italy, France, England, uh, as present-day Spain, uh, etc. It's the great era of monastic reform. And out of that, at the end of this era, at the end of the 11th century and the early 12th century, come what we could say the two great reform movements, greatest reform movements. There are others that are still with us. But the two greatest reform movements are the Carthusians and the Cistercians. They were not only important in terms of reviving Western mysticism, but they were very important in terms of being kind of the schools of thought, the monastic schools in which the golden age of monastic theology uh, reached its acme, the monastic theology that was crucial to the whole of the early uh, Middle Ages. Many of you will be familiar with Jean Leclerc's great book, The Love of Learning and the Desire for God, uh, first written in the 1950s and uh, is still in print. And if you want a good history of Western uh, medieval mysticism, uh, Leclerc's book is still a marvelous book and gives you a sense of the monastic culture and the monastic theology. It actually starts with Benedict and Gregory the Great and then moves on to these 12th century uh, figures. So just very briefly about these two reform movements, and then we're going to look at two representatives and what they have to say about the fourfold model. One is Guigo, I've already quoted. The second one will be the Cistercian, great friend of Bernard of Clairvaux, William of Saint-Thierry, and his little book called The Golden Epistle. These are both small, here's a copy of The Golden Epistle and the Cistercian Father's uh, translation. They're both small books, but they're very representative of uh, monastic prayer and monastic contemplation. So the Carthusians. Bruno of Cologne, whose dates are 1030 to 1101, was an early uh, scholastic teacher in Cologne itself, uh, who had a conversion to the monastic life and who wanted to found a new and very strict form of monasticism that would make use of Benedict's ideas but that also would in part return to the, the eremitical life, that is the hermit life that was part of the original uh, Desert Fathers. And so about the year uh, 1084, he founded a monastery, Le Grand Chartreuse, we call it, way up in the mountains in southern, uh, in, in southern France. And introduced this, uh, he then went on to actually form another house in, in Italy. Uh, but so these two houses, one in France, the Grand Chartreuse, and another one in Italy, became the kind of fountainhead for the new Carthusian order. And the Carthusian order, which of course survives to this day, is a combination of community monasticism, what's called cenobitical monasticism, and the hermit life, the eremitical life. Carthusians live independently in cells, and they get together at certain times, particularly on Sundays for common liturgy. But they generally live as, as hermits. And, if you, and many of you may have visited Carthusian houses, charter houses, as they're called, charter houses, the great ones left in England and uh, in other places all over the, uh, the continent. Um, and um, Bruno himself did not write a rule or organize things very much. He just founded the houses according to his own idea. But in the early decades of the 12th century, uh, certain of the priors of the, uh, the Grand Chartreuse wrote up statutes and ordinances that would be used along with the rule of Benedict for the, uh, the ordering of these Carthusian uh, houses. Carthusian's life was extremely uh, difficult life, dedicated to silence, dedicated to solitude, 
and particularly dedicated to simplicity in an even more powerful way than most of the other monastics. So it grew very slowly, but it did grow and became very, very important. It's the, uh, the only uh, monastic order that claims it never needed reform because it was never deformed. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we even have a few Carthusian houses in, uh, in, in the United States. They became very famous for their writings. The Carthusians contributed a good deal to the mystical tradition. And in the later Middle Ages, they became what you can call the publishing houses for spiritual and mystical literature. Because what did these monks do the day? Well, some of them, they did physical labor, but most of them wrote and copied manuscripts. And a lot of what survives of the spiritual and mystical literature uh, today was actually copied down in, uh, in Carthusian uh, houses. And uh, as I said, some of the great mystical authors, most likely the author of The Cloud of Unknowing, was the Carthusian. He keeps himself anonymous, but from kind of hints that he drops, it seems like uh, he, uh, he lived the Carthusian life. And so he represents Carthusian manner of prayer. Um, the ninth successor of Bruno was another Guigo. And this is Guigo II, who wrote that Scala Claustralium. He writes about 1170 or, uh, or, or something like that. It's a very popular work. Over 100 manuscripts survive. So Guigo gives us the, the Carthusian model for understanding lexio, meditatio, oratio, and contemplatio. Almost contemporary with the Carthusians and actually very closely allied with them were the Cistercians. Founded by a monastic reformer, an uh, uh, abbot named Robert, uh, in the year 1098 at a place called Citeaux. That's where the name Cistercian comes from. Uh, so just a few years after Bruno founded the Grand Chartreuse, Robert founded what he called the New Monastery. And his idea was, let's get a really good reform house here, go back to the original rule of Benedict, and try to live it in a, in a, a serious way. Um, it had a rocky foundation, and period, because uh, Robert was quite famous and powerful, and the monastery he left said, we want you back. He said, no, I want to stay here. So the monastery petitioned the local bishop and the pope, make Robert come back. And he had to come back. So he left this community there, and it could have died. It was only a handful of monks trying to live in this very difficult new form of, uh, of, of monastic life. But the new monastery didn't die. As a matter of fact, it began to flourish, but rather slowly, under two abbots, particularly this abbot Stephen Harding, who was an English abbot. This is the early 12th century now. And in the year 1112, a kind of miracle happened. This small, struggling monastery, all of a sudden, at the gate, at the door, arrived 30 Burgundian nobles seeking entry to become monks, <laughs> which like at least double the size of the monastery. <laughs> they were led by a young a Burgundian nobleman called Bernard, the man we know as a, today as, as Bernard of Clairvaux, who had spent, he decided he wanted to become a monk, and uh, he looked around to see what was the best form of monasticism, and he said, ah, oh, these people at the new monastery at Citeaux, they have the best form. Then he went on a kind of hunting trip to get all his friends and relatives to enter the monastery with him. Bernard was a very convincing guy. <laughs> he even broke up marriages, I regret to say. <laughs> but he said, you'd make a great monk. The guy said, but I'm married. Well, you have to convince your wife to enter a, nun a nunnery. <laughs> this happened, <laughs> believe me. And so Bernard arrives with 30 companions. And under the leadership of Stephen Harding, then, the new monastery takes off. Within a year, Citeaux founds what, what are called the first four daughters. It founds, in other words, it's too big, so they have to send monks out to found new monasteries. So the first four daughters of Citeaux, and Bernard becomes the abbot of one of those, Clairvaux. Uh, La Ferté, Morimont, Pontigny, and Clairvaux are the first four daughters, as they're called. And this 
Cistercian reform expands fantastically so that by the time of Bernard of Clairvaux's death in 1153, uh, there's like 350 monasteries all over Europe, either founded as Cistercian houses or older Benedictine houses that say, we want to belong to this new reform. You know, this is, this is great. And uh, this is where we, where we want to be. And the Cistercians also have a new kind of monasticism. They primarily observe the rule of Benedict, but they do so with a kind of explanatory document that they call the Carta Caritatis, the Charter of Charity, which lays down the rules for the new Cistercian order. And it is an order because it has a kind of constitutional representation that involves both descending authority and ascending authority. Descending authority because the abbot of Citeaux is the head of the whole, is the head of the whole order. And he has to visit each year the four daughter houses and make sure they're following the rule, the Carta Caritatis. And then the heads of those four daughter houses have to visit all the houses that were founded from them each year, supposedly. It gets very difficult when you got 350. Uh, to visit them and inspect them and make sure they're following the rules. And then there's an ascending authority as well because every year all the abbots from the Cistercian houses meet in general chapter at Citeaux, September 14th every year, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, and they discuss the business of the order and they issue rules and regulations. So you have a coherent structure to the Cistercians, such that the Benedictines never had uh, uh, before. This also inspires a tremendous outpouring of monastic literature, monastic theology, with Bernard of Clairvaux beginning in mid-1120s, writing a whole range of treatises, mystical treatises, theological treatises, and a number of other of the Cistercian abbots and, and monks, his contemporaries, also making these great contributions to primarily mystical theology. Uh, so we talk about the great Cistercian writers, and of course, many of you know Cistercian publications, and, uh, and they've made this material available to the contemporary reader in uh, many hundreds of volumes. So we have almost all the great Cistercian writers today. And I'm going to talk about one of those Cistercian writers, not Bernard himself, one could easily talk about Bernard, but I want to talk about Bernard's friend, William of Saint-Thierry who was a little bit older than Bernard of Clairvaux. Bernard of Clairvaux's dates are 1090 to 1153. Uh, William was probably born about 1080 and dies in 1147. Uh, William was theologically very well educated. Bernard was kind of self-taught in the monastery. William went to one of the local um, uh, new scholastic universities, we would call them today. But then he decided to enter the monastery. He enters a traditional Benedictine monastery um, at a place called Saint Thierry, and he becomes the abbot. But in the 1120s, he becomes very, fam very friendly with Bernard of Clairvaux, who's now abbot of, of Clairvaux, the older man and the younger man. And they meet often together and discuss with each other and influence each other's ideas uh, to a very great uh, extent. And, uh, William says to Bernard, I, I want to become a Cistercian because that's a higher form of monasticism than what, I mean, Bernard said, no, no, I, I don't want you to do that. But William prevails and eventually, as a relatively older man, 1135, Bernard says, all right, you can become, you can become a Cistercian. Uh, not as an abbot, just as a, as a simple monk. Uh, and they remain friendly throughout the whole course of their lives. William writes the first life of Bernard although Bernard, he, he predeceases Bernard, actually. And William has increasingly been recognized in the 20th century as the other great theological mind in the Cistercian order. There were many, Elred de Brivaux, Isaac of Stella, a whole range of uh, Garrick of Igni, uh, but Bernard and William, and their theologies are very close, but they're also very distinctive. Uh, and uh, towards the end of his life, in 1144, just a few years before he died, William writes this little treatise, it's a guidebook to the monastic life called the Epistola Aurea, the Golden Letter. And it's actually directed to a Carthusian house, <laughs> the neighboring Carthusian house. He writes up and says, I'm gonna send it to you guys. You know, this is the kind of monasticism we all should be, we all should be living. 
Uh, it's very, very popular. Maybe 60 or 70 manuscripts of this exist and are very widely read. And in the later Middle Ages, most people thought it was written by Bernard of Clairvaux. It's only in modern times that said, oh no, that's, that's really not uh, Bernard, that's, um, you know, that's, that's William of saint -Thierry. So those are the two people I want, to, uh, I want to talk about, and I'm going to talk about what they think about lexio, meditatio, oratio, and contemplatio. And uh, their, their, their thoughts on these key terms in, uh, in the history of contemplation are very close, as we'll see, but they have you know, distinctive elements that I think reflect uh, the richness, I put it that way, the richness of the tradition about this path of prayer. So, let me just, again, I, I'll, I'll read that, that first text and then I'm going to take the four terms in order and say a little bit about what each of these thinks they mean and how they fit together. So, reading, I'm reading Guigo again. Reading is a careful study of scripture, concentrating all one's powers on it. Meditation is a busy application of the mind to seek with the help of one's reason for knowledge of hidden truths. Prayer is the heart's devoted turning to God to drive away evil and obtain what is good. Contemplation is when the mind is in some sort of way lifted up to God and held above itself so that it tastes the joys of everlasting sweetness. So we start with reading. We start with Lexio Divina as the first rung on the ladder. And it's a very, very important rung. And of course, the image of the ladder here is, uh, is, is very, very crucial. That's another one of the great symbols in the history of Christian mysticism, ascending the ladder up to God. And the monks and others who use that image often pointed to the famous text in the book of Genesis, chapter 28, when Jacob has a dream and sees angels going up and down the ladder between heaven and earth. So this is what they have in mind. And Benedict in his rule talks about the ladder in chapter seven, the ladder of the various stages of humility going up and pride coming down, etc. So the, the, the ladder image is, uh, is really crucial. It's a ladder for monks. And the four terms on the ladder Lexio, meditatio, ratio, and contemplatio. These are traditional. They weren't invented by Guigo. They weren't invented by William. They were something that the monks had talked about for many, many centuries. And these steps are, are distinct steps, but you can never separate them. They fit together. They're integrated. And in a certain sense, you can move up and down. You may be able to move up to contemplatio, but you can't stay at the level of contemplatio. So we have to go back down to lexio. So you have to integrate all of them. They interpenetrate, and they're all necessary. A quote Guigo. These steps are joined together in such a way, each one serving the other in mutual fashion, that the earlier stages are of little or no use without the later ones. And those, the later ones, can scarcely or never be obtained without the former. So you'll never get to contemplation unless you start with lexio, uh, is what, uh, or you can almost never get to contemplation unless you start with lexio. So what is lexio divina, and why is it important? Well, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, if someone was talking about this, hardly anybody would have heard of lexio divina. I'll bet. Everybody in this room has heard of, uh, of Lexio uh, Divina. And its recovery in various ways has been a significant part of a kind of contemplative movement, I think, of the last half century. And uh, I st much has been written on this, but I strongly recommend uh, the Australian Cistercian Michael Casey's book. There are other good books. But Michael Casey's book, many of you know it, Sacred Reading, The Ancient Art of Lexio Divina is a very good introduction. Let me just quote from a couple of quotations from Michael Casey. Lexio Divina is a technique of prayer and a guide to living. It is a means of descending to the level of the heart and finding God. So you ascend, but you can also descend. We should see Lexio Divina, he goes on, not only as a technique of prayer, 
but as a preparation for contemplation. I think that sentence is a very good summary of, uh, of what it means. Sacred reading, this is from another place in this book. Sacred reading is a way of spending time with God's revealed word. It involves reflection on the meaning of the text, application to our own situation, and a willingness to be led into prayer. So it's a school of contemplation, it's an opening to God, it's a spiritual practice. And uh, Casey gives you good examples, not only of the importance of it, but also the practice of it, the practical side of it. It is fundamentally slow reading. You know, we're all concerned with speed reading today. The monks were exactly the opposite. They wanted slow reading, slow, meditative, ruminative reading. Uh, and they felt that, and we today, I think, there's a place for speed reading. All of us have to read quickly, particularly if you have an academic life or something. There's a lot of material you have to read and absorb. But I think sometimes we've forgotten about the importance of slow reading. Uh, and Lexio Divina is a return to the emphasis on the necessity for, for a slow reading. It's a prayerful reading of texts. For many people, these may be the liturgical readings of the day. And uh, Casey talks about those. But Casey emphasizes, very Benedictine, going back to the rule of Benedict, slow reading of an entire biblical book over a period of time or also some classic of the mystical, uh, mystical tradition. And he recommends you know, half an hour a day and uh, kind of sticking to it, et cetera. You can read the practical details of, uh, uh, of, of Casey's view. And I think that's very close to what the monks were doing. And it's also uh, very obvious in um, what William Santillery has to say about Lexio in his golden letter. He actually ha has a longer section on Lexio than, than what uh, Guigo has. So I'll give you a few uh, hints from what William says. According to William, Lexio Divina needs to be fixed. Fixed times. At fixed times, you should give yourself to some definite reading. You should concentrate on certain authors and let your mind grow accustomed to them. It's fixed, it has to be faithful and persevering. He says, the scriptures need to be read and understood in the same spirit in which they were written. You will never enter into Paul's meaning until by constant application to reading him and by giving yourself to constant meditation, you have imbibed his spirit. So you have to stick with it and try to get the spirit of the author or the book of the Bible that you are reading. It's repetitive, slow reading that, is spilled, that spills over into the day. It's chewing the text. The uh, monastic authors often talked about ruminatio. Ruminatio is what a cow does. <laughs> the cow ruminates. It chews its cud uh, over and over again to get out the full possibility of nourishment. Here again, I'm just going to quote, some part of your daily reading should each day be stored in the stomach of memory and left to be digested. <laughs> and at times it should be brought up again for frequent rumination. <laughs> Here you are, you're a monk cow. You're a monk cow. <laughs> you should select something, and I think this is important, you should, like, should select something that is in keeping with your calling and in line with your personal orientation something that will seize hold of the mind and not allow it to think over alien matters. So no, it should be in accordance with your calling, whether you're a monk or a lay person, but it also should be something that's in line with your personal orientation. You're going to get more out of books that you're interested in, even books of the Bible. There may be some books of the Bible you feel a kind of sympathy with that you don't feel with others. Well, William would say, you know, choose the ones that are like your orientation, but really study them. Read them slowly, ruminate on them, think of them during the course of the day. And finally, such Lexio, Lexio Divina, is going to provide the opening to the further stages, Meditatio, Oratio, and Contemplatio. And William says these higher stages will begin to 
erupt into your practice of Lexio. Again, I quote him. The reading should also stimulate the feeling and give rise to prayer, which should interrupt your reading. An interruption that should not so much hamper the reading as restore it to a mind more purified for understanding. So meditatio and oratio, if you're doing your Lectio Divina, are going to be coming into it as you begin the reading, and you should be willing to stop the reading at that stage and take the fruit from further meditation and from oration. So that's Lectio Divina. Let's move on to uh, stages two and three, meditatio and oratio. If you read over what Guigo and William, and I'm just using those examples, many other monks have to say, these two broad terms, meditatio and oratio, are very closely related. And it's often hard to distinguish. One gives rise to the other. Meditatio gives rise to oratio, and oratio comes back to meditatio. One way to understand them would be to say that meditatio and oratio are what we contribute to prayer. Contemplatio is what God does. We have to make the effort of meditatio and oratio, and if we do make that effort, we'll begin to get the kind of grace that is contemplatio, that comes to us from God. So those, those two middle terms, and the final goal of contemplatio are intimately, intimately related. It's what we do, and then it's what, it's what um, God does. Guigo gives a good example of, uh, of meditatio. Uh, he takes one of the classic texts of Christian mysticism, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. And he says, well, you should meditate on that text. You should meditate on that text like putting a grape in your mouth and crushing the grape and tasting it, and tasting all the implications of it, chewing on it to get out the full meaning of it. And how do you chew on the grape of that text? Well, he's, he advises other texts from scripture that shed some light on what it means to be pure of heart and what it may mean to see God. Now, of course, he's talking to monks who know the Bible much better than any of us do, because they're praying the Bible day after day after day, and so they have a kind of uh, you know, memory bank of, of scriptural texts that they'll be able to, uh, you know, to bring to this work of chewing away on what this particular uh, text might mean. Uh, and these a series of biblical texts that you think of, this activity, he claims, will set the soul alight and begin to give it its first intimation of what he calls divine sweetness. It's just an intimation. The example he uses here is, smelling good food and tasting good food. As you meditate, begin to get the sense of there's something good out there, I can smell it. But you're not yet tasting it. The tasting of that fruit is going to come in contemplatio. But the smelling of the good odor kind of leads you on. That's what the, the practice of meditatio should, uh, uh, should lead one to. And according to Guigo then, Oratio is what comes as a result of that experience of meditatio and a beginning sense of the, the divine uh, uh, sweetness. Uh, that you sense a gap between, you know there's something very good out there and yet you haven't had a full experience of it. And so you turn to God and you pray to God, oratio, a petition to God, in which you say, please God, give me more of this experience. Quote, so give me, God, this is the prayer that you might make from your meditatio as you move into oratio. So give me, Lord, some pledge of what I hope to inherit, at least one drop of heavenly rain with which to refresh my thirst, for I am, in fire, I, I am on fire with, uh, with love. So meditatio leads on to, uh, to oratio. Um, Guigo himself wrote a series of meditations uh, that are, have been translated into English and are wonderful examples of the oratio and meditatio in a certain sense that's combined. I, won't, I have brought along one of those, but our time is, uh, is moving along here. What does um, William Santiri say about meditation? 
William emphasizes meditation on the life of Christ in very good Cistercian fashion. He says, the best and safest reading matter and subject matter for meditation for the beginner, the animal man, newly come to Christ to train him in interior life is the outward actions of our Redeemer. In them he should find an example of humility, a stimulant to charity and to sentiments of, uh, of piety. So William here is, is emphasizing that you know, you can use a variety of scriptural texts, but meditation on the events of Christ's life, Christ as the loving redeemer, what Bernard of Clairvaux called the carnal love of Christ, amor carnalis Christi, love of Christ the God-man, because we have to start at that level. We can't start at the spiritual level. We have to start at the, the fleshly level of Christ, the man who comes to redeem us. And William says that's the, that's the, primary, uh, that's the primary form of meditatio doesn't exclude others. And like uh, Guigo, William feels that that kind of meditatio will lead on to oratio. And so his golden treatise talks a lot about the different kinds of prayer. He deals with the four kinds of prayer from 1 Timothy. He explains how prayer can be unceasing. Again, our friend 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, etc. And uh, he emphasizes what I would call the kind of the continuity of prayer. That is, the carnal beginner starts with the prayer of petition. But the advanced rational monk on the second level will have a prayer of desire to enjoy the sweetness of God, rather similar to what uh, Guigo says. And finally, you move on to the spiritual prayer of the perfect which is the wordless and imageless enjoyment of divine sweetness in union with God. So the three stages of prayer, the beginners, the middle group or proficient, and the perfect, are all, they're all on a kind of continuum of, uh, of prayer life. Person who prays for the experience of sweetness, William says, is rational as long as he depends on reason in this, but after he has attained it, it is spiritual, the man and a man of God ought to be always either rational in seeking God or spiritual in loving God. So you kind of come back and forth between these forms of, uh, of oratio. And William, too, wrote a series of meditations, meditaciones, as examples of prayer. Uh, there are 13 of them. He actually composed them when he was still uh, a Benedictine abbot. And they're some of the most beautiful prayers in the Middle Ages. Meditation on the Trinity, two meditations on Christ's passion, uh, meditation on the embrace of the divine bridegroom. Uh, if you really want to read some of the most powerful medieval meditation orations, they, they really go together. Guigo and William, St. Anselm also wrote meditations in a very similar, uh, similar vein. And particularly in his meditations, William emphasizes Christ's passion as a kind of access and highest form of pre-contemplative prayer that we can make. I'll read you just one uh, quotation here before we get to our last stage of contemplatio. Um, this is uh, Meditation 10. Uh, and he talks about the soul now gazing towards the loving face of God, but it's a loving face of God as revealed in the Passion. The soul seems to see you as you are while she ponders your goodness towards her in her sweet thoughts about the wonderful sacrament of your passion. The goodness is as great as you are. It is what you are. She seems to you, she seems to see you as you are, face to face, when as the face of supreme goodness you appear to her on the cross in the midst of your saving work. The meditation on the face of Christ in the Passion actually reveals, gives you a face-to-face -face vision of God in, uh, in this life. Okay, in the time that remains, I just want to say something about the culmination, contemplatio, as a part of this progressive and integrated uh, map that both uh, Guigo and uh, William uh, give us. Guigo teaches that oratio is closely tied to contemplatio. 
In the sixth chapter of the Ladder of Monks, he says that the Lord, who is attentive to the meaning and not the words of our prayer, does not wait, I'm, I'm quoting here, does not wait until the longing soul has said it all, but breaks in upon the soul in the middle of its prayer, runs to meet it in haste, sprinkles it with sweet heavenly dew. He slakes its thirst, he feeds its hunger, he makes the soul forget all earthly things. By making it die to itself, he gives it a new and wonderful life. By making it drunk, he brings it back to its true senses. Note these paradoxes of mystical language. But you see, God there is acting. This is the part that God does. As you are practicing your meditatio and your oratio, God doesn't wait for you to finish. He breaks in on his own initiative to begin to give you the experience of, con of contemplatio. And you'll note in that passage, uh, Guigo's making use of some of the typical language and tropes of of the highest forms of mysticism, the mystical death, the mores mystica, as they call it in Latin. In a certain sense, you die, at least to the created world. And also, sacra ebreitas, sacred inebriation, in a sense. You know, you, you, are, you lose your mind, your ordinary mind in one way, but not in the, the lower sense of, of a carnal inebriation. It's in the higher sense of a spiritual inebriation. Those motifs in the history of mysticism go back for a thousand years at least uh, before, you know, before uh, Guigo is writing. And what about William? Contemplatio in William is a very broad term, so somewhat similar to Gregory the Great as I was talking about uh, this morning. It's a word he never defines because it uh, kind of uh, matches almost everything in his spiritual vocabulary. All the major themes of William's distinctive mysticism relate to contemplatio, such as the notion of seeing the face of God, of having a vision of God, or the understanding of love, intellectus amoris, and the unity of spirit, unitas spiritus. William and Bernard and most of the 12th century authors loved one of the great passages from Paul. It's 1 Corinthians 6.17. No biblical passage is more quoted in the mystical tradition than 1 Corinthians 6.17, which says, the person who adheres to God becomes one spirit with God. Qui adhirat Deo una spiritus est, is the Latin. I quote that over and over again because for them, that's the biblical proof for becoming one spirit with God, of achieving a kind of unity with God. And so, unitas spiritus, oneness of spirit, is a kind of formula to express 1 Corinthians 6, 17. And William, throughout his whole career, wrote endlessly about contemplation. So it's, it's very hard to summarize it. And it's interesting, one of his, his earliest work as a treatise called On Contemplating God, which he wrote while he was still a Benedictine, probably around 1122. But if you read that treatise through, he doesn't talk about contemplation. It's a general account of the path to God, because the whole thing is contemplation, de contemplando Deo. But in his later works, he also talks very explicitly about contemplation. In the middle of his career, in the 1130s, around the time he became a Cistercian, he wrote a commentary on the Song of Songs, an exposition on the Song uh, of Songs, in which he often talks about uh, contemplation. I'll read you just one uh, example of this, but contemplation is scattered all over that treatise, which is you know, one of the great treatises on the Song of Songs. He's talking about the text from Song of Songs 1-4, where the bridegroom says to the bride, your eyes are like doves. Your eyes are like doves. Spiritually interpreted, mystically interpreted, this is how uh, William reads this. The two eyes that are like doves signify reason and love. Reason and love that are the two eyes of contemplation that have to work together as one ascends towards union. And the two eyes become one here I'm quoting, when in the contemplation of God, in which love is chiefly operative, reason 
passes over into love and is formed into a kind of spiritual or divine understanding which surpasses and absorbs all reason. So reason is important, but it ascends to a level where it's absorbed into love. It's transcended in a certain sense. It becomes what William called the intellectus amoris, the understanding of love. Or that he also expresses in another very famous phrase, love itself is a form of understanding. Amor ipse intellectus est. No, not ratio. Love is not reason. But love becomes a deeper kind of understanding in the highest level of, uh, of contemplatio. And that notion of the understanding of love, the intellectus amoris, kind of crucial to all of the, uh, the Cistercian writers. So finally, in his last major work, which is the golden letter here, the golden epistle, he also talks a good deal about uh, a contemplatio and unitas a spiritus, um, uses that text, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but he emphasizes that our oneness with God that comes in contemplation is Trinitarian. It's fundamentally Trinitarian, and it's centered on the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. And so when you reach the height of contemplation, when you come to oneness of spirit, unitas spiritus, which is also understanding of love, the intellect is fidei, you, in a certain sense, become the Holy Spirit, joining together the Father and the Son. They say, uh oh, that sounds bad. We become the Holy Spirit. William explains pretty carefully what he means by that. And I, in our terminology, I say we could understand it best by saying we become the Holy Spirit operationally. That is, we share in love as uniting the Father and the Son. We don't become the Holy Spirit substantially in the sense that our human nature is, you know, becomes the divine nature. But we're sharing in the uniting activity, the loving activity, that is the office, the, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. I'll close just by quoting uh, the passage. There are many passages where he says that, but uh, towards the end of the golden letter. He who is the love of the Father and the Son, that's the Holy Spirit. He who is the love of the Father and the Son, their unity, their sweetness, their good, their kiss, their embrace, and whatever else they have in common, he becomes for man in regard to God in the manner appropriate to man what he is for the Son with regard to the Father and for the Father in regard to the Son. The soul in its bliss finds itself standing midway in the embrace and kiss of the Father and the Son. So, contemplatio for William is sharing in the life of the Trinity, especially in its focus on, on the action of the Holy Spirit. <laughs>